Why were over half of the 80,000 T-34s ever built knocked out? It's the most produced and the most destroyed tank of the Second World War. And while it's surrounded by myths and legends, we're going to walk you through the real journey of this tank and show you the small but crucial things that often get overlooked. Now to understand how and why it came to the first T-34 model, we have to take a look at how the Red Army wanted their tanks to be used. One of the new ideas for using the armored force was a tactic called the Warfare of Annihilation. This would be a massive, technologically advanced force that would decimate the enemy quickly and decisively. As Stalin came to power, he really liked this idea, so in 1929 he launched a massive industrialization program to rearm and re-equip the Red Army with modern weapons. They bought a couple of British Vickers tanks and a license for the American Walter Christie tank, which never actually went into production. Now, the Soviets developed the Vickers into the T-26 tank and began producing it in huge numbers, while from the Christie design came the fast BT series. As the Soviets initially struggled with their industrialization process, and those tanks already seemed not suitable for what looked like a new global conflict, they wanted to replace them with something better and easier to produce in huge numbers. Here comes Mikhail Koshkin, the designer of the T-34. He came out with his first model, the A-20, and with sloped armor it was quite an interesting concept, but at the time it was still complicated technology for mass production, so the idea was dropped. However, after the T-26 and BT tanks showed their lack of protection against enemy fire in the Battle of Lake Kassan in 1938, as well as many other important lessons, the Soviets now wanted a new, better protected, and also a universal tank that would combine and improve all the good characteristics of the early tanks they had. That would eventually become what we now know today as the T-34. For the time, the 76mm gun was quite powerful, and the sloped armor was revolutionary. Just as a side note, the Germans were building their early tanks all the way up to the Tiger I with a box-like structure. And after their encounters with the T-34 as the war began, they actually started to implement sloped armor in tanks like the Panther and the Tiger II. Now the T-34 got better armor, a V-12 diesel engine, whose designer, by the way, got executed in one of several of Stalin's purges. The transmission was having issues at the beginning, but it got improved over time, and through errors and trials, the T-34 was taking shape and entering production, just as Germany showed the world what tanks could do in their blitzkrieg tactics during the invasions of Poland and France. The designer of the T-34 actually died from pneumonia just as the first tanks went into service. As the German invasion of the Soviet Union began in 1941, they had only about 900 T-34s, 500 KV-1s, and the rest were all BT and T-26 series, numbered in the thousands. When the Germans, who had gotten used to encountering light Soviet tanks, faced the T-34 for the first time, it was quite a shock. It was better armoured and better armed than any German tank at the time. The most common German anti-tank gun was the 37mm, and the largest gun on their tanks at the time was just 50mm. The T-34's 76mm gun was over 50% larger. German rounds bounced off the frontal slope of the T-34 while they had no protection against its gun. There was an account where Germans fired 25 37mm rounds at a T-34 and only one of those managed to jam the turret. However, early in the war, Soviet tanks were used by just poorly trained, inexperienced crews with basically no communication with other friendly forces. Early basic training for a tanker was just 72 hours, so good luck in your combat debut. They were using flags and signals for communication, while only the platoon commander had a radio, so you could just imagine how that would look in combat. It was just tactically a disaster, and they were getting decimated in combat, either outflanked by experienced German panzer units, or destroyed from long range with 88mm anti-aircraft guns. The Germans already knew how to deal with heavy armor from their experience in France with heavy tanks like the Matilda and the Char B1. The other thing that caused so many of the T-34s to get destroyed was their crude ergonomics, and especially the early two-man turret. The gunner and commander were manning the extremely cramped space around the 76mm gun. You see, the turret was taken over from the A-20, which had and was designed for a much smaller 45mm gun. The commander had just a single periscope as his only way to see outside, and he was also the one loading the gun. The official rate of fire was about five rounds per minute, but in the reality of combat, this was about only two rounds per minute. Germans, on the other hand, in their Panzer IVs, had a commander's cupola in the back of the turret with which he could lead the gunner directly onto targets. They also had a third man in the turret, the loader, with only one job during combat. So because of that, the Soviets couldn't effectively use even a fraction of what was supposed to be, for the time, revolutionary armor and firepower. 
The problem with the angled armor is that although it improved protection, there was not a lot of practical space inside the tank. And another problem was armor quality. The Soviets used a special steel alloy that was strong but brittle and prone to splintering. Even from non-penetrating hits, steel fragments could peel off the armor at great speed, becoming shrapnel and ending up in the crew's faces. Soviet ammunition was also more prone to catching fire, and their fire extinguishers used toxic carbon tetrachloride. So you'd probably want to get out of the tank even if you managed to put out the fire. And when we talk about fire, the early T-34 had a single extremely heavy hatch on the turret. And for the driver, it was even worse with his awkward forward hatch. This contributed to the Soviets having two men killed per destroyed tank. And to make that number more dramatic, they mostly had a three-man crew. For comparison, the American Sherman had five men, and on average only 1.3 crew members were lost when a tank was knocked out. When it came to crew safety and comfort, well, there was basically not much of either. The driver was in anything but a comfortable position behind the frontal slope, and you'd need to be a four-foot powerlifter if you wanted to drive and shift gears effectively. In early models, the bow gunner didn't even have a hatch, couldn't see almost anything, and if he needed to bail out, he'd better be fast and lucky. The turret traverse was very fast, performing a full circle within just 10 seconds, but it needed to be manually fine adjusted, and it was a bit tricky, as the turret would continue spinning after releasing the traverse handle. There was also no turret basket, so the gunner and commander, besides all their already overwhelming tasks, had to watch where they rested their legs, if they wanted to keep them. Visibility from inside the early T-34 was catastrophic from all positions, and the optics were quite bad compared to what the Germans had. However, the 76mm gun was improved, using the same caliber but with better penetration, thanks to armor-piercing composite rigid shells. And again, when you take a look at the thickest part of German tanks being 60mm, and this gun could go through 90mm at 500m, one would have to wonder why they were still being destroyed so badly by the Germans. One of the factors early in the war was a severe shortage of ammunition within the Red Army, leaving entire divisions with no shells for their tanks. Because of this, there were instances of Soviets ramming German tanks, driving over anti-tank guns, and fighting with just a couple of shells for their main gun at best. Now, as the war on the Eastern Front was entering a new phase and the Red Army was being pushed almost all the way to Moscow, the Soviets had to move their tank factories to protect them from the advancing Germans. So, for a brief moment, almost all tank production was paused and factories were moved deep behind the Ural Mountains. Workers and factories could now operate 24-7 and be safe from bombing raids in order to replace the 20,000 tanks they had lost in 1941 alone during the German advance. At this moment, the main focus was on the speed and efficiency of production, so everything else became less important. Like the driver's seat, for example. He could also drive without it, so why bother making one? Same with the rubber on road wheels and sometimes even paint. The Soviets were looking at everything they could either simplify or cut out, while trying to improve what they thought really mattered on the battlefield. Throughout its production evolution, the T-34 would end up with twice the thickness of its armor, double the penetration power, and at the same time, cut production cost by about 40%. At the height of production in 1942, they were putting out 1,200 T-34s per month. Now, just for comparison, the Germans made about 1,300 Tiger Ones throughout the entire war. And that was only one month of T-34 production for the Soviets. The strength came with numbers, logically, and that was observed very soon on the battlefield but the other side also had something to say. The Germans improved their guns from the early 37 and 50 mm to the high velocity 75 mm anti-tank gun, which was now being mounted on Panzer IVs and in much more numerous Stug assault guns. These long barreled 75s were deadly to the T-34 at longer range. It is now the summer of 1943, and with the introduction of the Panther alongside upgunned Panzer IVs and Stugs, the T-34 was again entering a critical phase for its survival. That sparked the development of the T-43, which kept about 70% of the T-34, improving the armor and adding a better turret and a more powerful 85mm gun. However, the project was unsuccessful, as the tank was much less mobile than the T-34, so the Soviets tried to find a better solution. They realized they could enlarge the turret ring by 7 inches, then use the new three-man turret intended for the T-43 and with some adaptation put it on the modified T-34 hull. And voila! they got the T-34-85. As it entered service in 1944, the T-34-85 was actually quite a different tank compared to the early T-34, finally somewhat addressing the ergonomics to make crew's life a bit easier. The hull was not much changed, besides the thicker 90mm armour plate, but the turret was a game-changer. The commander got his cupola, the turret had a basket, and the ammo storage was improved. 
Ammo capacity, however, went down from 90 to around 50 rounds due to the larger shells, and they could only have nine ready for quick firing. Also, the now three-man turret significantly improved combat effectiveness, as the gunner and commander could finally focus on their jobs while the loader would feed the gun. More tanks came with radios, not all of them, but still, it improved communication. Also, the big improvement was that the tanks finally began to be used more tactically and that doctrine of war of annihilation could actually be used as intended. The Soviets would master the deep battle doctrine from 1944 onwards and begin that unstoppable push all the way to Berlin eventually. Enormous artillery barrages would be followed by tanks with infantry riding on top and dismounting to engage. They even had these neat handles to cling onto. So, through its turbulent history in World War II, the T-34 would improvise, improve, and overcome most of the challenges in one way or another. And it was actually a tank that remained in service in many countries after the war, even seeing some combat in the 21st century.